we've been reading Marx lately in a reading mm-hmm. group. Kind of this is I actually hadn't read hardly any of Capital before. I'd always kind of studiously avoided it. So thank you for forcing me to to read it and read it thoroughly. Um, but you know, Marx is oftentimes I mean, people think in these polarities right now. And so it's either capitalism or communism or capitalism versus socialism or something like that. But we but we know that Marx was every bit as much a materialist, not in your sense, but in the broader right, sense, yeah. um, as, as Adam Smith ever thought of being. And communism is not necessarily an ideology that will, will help us solve environmental problems. Um, it, it does get to the class analysis, which I think that we need more mm-hmm. of, you know, but I, I guess I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, given the fact that you're, you've, you're about ready to finish up a year of studying critical theory, um, a lot of which is kind of what post Marxist in its orientation. Yeah. Um, why, why did you want to go back and read Marx and what I get in, let's talk about this in the light of, of uh, Mackenzie work as well, which, which I covered on the channel and which the reading group also covered. Like, is there a good reason for going back and, and, and uh, studying Marx and reading capital right now, considering all of that? Yeah. So, I mean, like, aside from the fact that he's probably, you know, whatever, someone can fight me on this, like the most influential thinker globally. Um, I mean, I mean, I would possibly even say ever. Um, uh, I, I mean, other than maybe you know, like Jesus um, or something like this, uh, right? But uh, as far as philosophers go, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, so I think it's useful to go back and read Marx because to date, um, his analysis of the, you know, I, I he would probably say the inner workings of capitalism, uh, you know, it, there, it's second to almost none. Uh, and it's also anybody who's commenting on capitalism today has to engage with this text, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, wh- whether you're Wark who says, okay, capital is dead and we're moving beyond this, right? To even make the statement that capital is dead, right? What did she have to do? She had to go and she had to excavate capital from Marx's text, you know, I, I think she did like the Grand Risa or whatever, you know, but, mm-hmm. but she had to go back and read Marx. So I think, I mean, one, I don't think capital is dead. Um, and, and this is one reason I think it's important to read Marx. Um, but two, I, I mean, I think if, if you make the assumption like I do, um, right, that like, Human society and nature are not two separate spheres, but one set, one single sphere. And capitalism is not just this separate entity that is like, you know, throwing bombs against this other separate entity, which is capital in nature. Um, but that capital is actually a way of organizing, producing, and or reproducing natures and environments. Uh, you know, cons- nature not just as like static, you know, Yosemite or something, but the entire web of, of biodiversity and, um, you know, biogeochemical flows and all of this, uh, right, then you need to understand how capital works um, to understand, you know, what is it actually doing to the environment and why is it doing this thing? Can it be salvaged? Um, what parts of it can be salvaged? I mean, I'm, it's almost now it's like nothing really. Um, but, but that's kind of my gist of why we should go back and read Marx is because, I mean, he provides probably the best, I mean, maybe not the clearest, right? You know, as we've seen in our reading group. Uh, he repeats but, himself a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, right, like it, it, in terms of kind of laying out, like in, you know, like I think one of our people said, you know, like lecture format, you know, ABC, this is how capitalism works. Um, you know, these are the fundamental kind of building blocks. This mm-hmm. is how they interact. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, if you if you can't understand this, right, like capitalism is just this like super generalized signifier for you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I mean, not in like academic circles, because I mean, most people have, you know, engaged with like texts on capitalism, whether it's Marx or others, right? But I mean, in, in some circles uh, on the left, I think there's a tendency to just say like, capitalism is bad, you know, and it's this over generalized and I mean, overdetermined, uh, I guess would be the way of saying it. Like it's an overdetermined signifier, right? Mm -hmm. um, kind of devoid of any content other than its connotation, right? Mm -hmm. So by kind of going through capital as we've done in the reading group, um, you know, and obviously we're not doing the whole book uh, because we have lives um, outside of the reading group. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like we're, we're, you know, what we're trying to do is we're kind of trying to excavate the denotation, right? Um, you know, what, what is the denotation of this thing that is usually just evoked, you know, as a signifier of, you know, a negative exploitative, uh, you know, force. So. Right. Yeah. Well, I found it very useful. Um, and, you know, I must say, yes, you know, a little tedious, but easy, way easier to understand than I thought it was going to be partly because it's so tedious. Like he mm -hmm. takes little baby steps all the way along. Yeah. To the, he, he's extremely, extremely thorough. Right. You could probably use it as a sleeping pill, but you know, like that's, but that's why, yeah. right. But yeah. you know, like by the time he, you're done with a chapter, you definitely know what he's trying to say because he's, right. You know, hammered it in so hard yeah. but I you know like my, my your your comments about some some on the left kind of having a particular perspective on um, on Marx and maybe not not a very specific specific one um, I mean would would you say you know I've run into let's say in the natural sciences I've run into people who kind of look down on um, reading Darwin because they say, oh, well, we know a lot more than Darwin knew, you know, so why should we have anybody read Darwin anymore? The old man, you know, Darwin. Right, yeah. um, do, you, do you run into that um, type of thing concerning Marx that, that, that some folks just say, yeah, it's passe, you know, why do we read that anymore? We can read these 10 authors that wrote their books five years ago. Y yeah, and I'm, so we've, right, again, we've had this discussion before um, and I think it's interesting because, right, on the one hand, there are, there are, like, people who I think are kind of, you know, why would you read anything before 2000, for example, the year 2000, right? Yeah. Like, just the most contemporary stuff, um, you know, or, oh, the advent of postmodernism. So, you know, we destroyed Marx's narrative. Why do we need to go back to this? But then, right, then there's the other like camp of folks who are like, um, yeah, um, I threw the Bible away and I bought this new one. It's called Capital uh, and it's in three volumes. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> you know, and, and this, I mean, yeah, it, it's oh, wait. Where, where it becomes a dogma. Uh, and this is like the opposite end of the spectrum where you're just like, you know, this is the way, the truth, and the light, yeah, um, or, or the life. I can remember, you know, whatever. Uh, it's probably all. Um, that's but, some sort of like mental fixation. I've come yeah. to believe, right? Like that's not that that that's not connecting with with the real world. It's becoming kind of obsessed and fixated <laughs> on a particular author, and yeah, I, you know, you do see that, and it, then it becomes like, oh, can we let's concentrate on making sure we get marks exactly right? Well. Right why you know like we are you know oh, the only good reason for reading marx would be well first of all like yeah you shouldn't get off the planet probably without having read marx simply because he's so such a foundational thinker right yeah. but also because of current concerns like that would be the right. reason to kind of spur thought and you know i think there's a tendency in more contemporary thought to try to move away from economic class as a category and marx reminds you of, of the reality of that. So that's a value, right? Because I, I think the 
I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the reason why there's been a tendency to move away from just straight up economic class has to do with the fact that the proletariat never became the revolutionary subject in most in in most of the settings in which they were expected to do so. And in fact, that the so-called proletariat um, was largely kind of a, a conservative force right. yeah. um, in a lot of cases. And now, of course, we don't even, would. so people argue, is there a proletariat? I don't, I don't have a problem with that. You know, like the problem is we have an underclass. We might not have a, a you know, factory workers or not the majority of the underclass, but so there, anyway, there's that question as well. And so people have, ten, in, on the left, have tend to move away from talking in terms of just straight up economic class. Um, I guess Bernie Sanders tried to revive that in a way. And we, and we see what happened to him, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with this, but do you, do you have any comment about, you know, like what, what if anything, we can take away from Marx that say say people on the left could take away from Marx. And by the way, I'm not necessarily identifying myself as on the left. I'm kind of like all over the place, as you know. Right. But I'm just I'm just asking the question because it aggravates me sometimes to see people who are on the left in the United States kind of move away from their what I consider to be their core message mm -hmm. of economic equality and things like that anyway i'll i've stopped rambling now yeah, yeah. well no, i mean I, I, that was good and yeah so there's a lot of things there i think the first thing i'll say is that like again like on the question of why read marx and and also you know what can we take away is like a certain like kind of a more pragmatic or practical approach to reading theory of you know, what can theory do, uh, right? How can I use this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's not necessarily about like getting the person right, right? But it's like, if they say something useful to you, you know, for your, you know, if you're a critical theorist, right? Like you probably have these, you know, emancipatory, emancipatory objectives for society, right? So like, how can theory, how can something that, you know, whether it's Plato or Wendell Berry or, you know, Karl Marx, <laughs> how can what these guys say, and this is bad because, right, it's all men, but I guess that shows, you know, what theory unfortunately is sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but like, what, what do these guys say that is useful to you in your context? Um, and, like, I guess the, the big takeaways from Marx are, like, I mean, to me, the way in which like surplus value is generated, right? Because that's really, I mean, if we think of it, like that's the kind of underlying like goal, right? Is to generate surplus value, which then can be reinvested, you know, as capital, mm -hmm. um, right? And, and the way in which he talks about this is kind of, you know, basically you do this by exploiting labor. Uh, I mean, this is like, I mean, everybody should, I think, read read this part of him and understand him, uh, right? But then we can, like, for me, he's especially useful, right? Because if you understand the way in which surplus value is generated through the exploitation of labor, right? So, and I mean, I guess, like, a quick way, I'll do, like, a very quick explanation of, you know, okay, so, like, there's a 12-hour working day, you know, we're going to call you the capitalist, you know, because I want to be the good guy in this scenario. Um, right. So, so you my pay, hat on. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you're like Mr. Monopoly or whatever. Um, uh, Mr. Moneybags or something. Uh, the, yeah, you look like the guy from the Monopoly board. Uh -huh. um, right. You pay me 10 bucks and I am your, your like labor to, you know, whatever, um, make bobbleheads um, for 12 hours. Right. Yet, in because labor is what generates value in six hours um i've already produced enough value um to reproduce myself as a worker so in six hours in other words i've generated enough revenue to you as a capitalist that you can pay me so that i can buy food and clothes you know and pay my 
you know, probably astronomical rent because let's say we're in, you know, New York or London or something. Um, but then those other six hours, right. Cause you, you've, uh, you, uh, you pay me the, the 10 bucks for, for, for working 12 hours. And in six hours, you know, I've, I've already replenished myself. Those other six hours, what I'm doing is I'm generating value for you. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So this is the exploitation of labor. Right. But if you kind of understand like, this generation of surplus value and I'm going to make a distinction like the form of it. Okay. So kind of the more abstract form as opposed to the specific content. Right. So like the exploitation of labor would be the specific content of the form of generation of surplus value. Right. And the form would be the exploitation of one of the quote unquote ingredients of production, right? Mm -hmm. Whether this is labor, whether this is the environment, et cetera. Um, and this to me is what has been useful, I guess, for kind of thinking about, you know, why is it that capitalism is this degrading force? Um, you know, why is it that, you know, we're constantly like plowing under more forest or whatever it may be um, and I guess kind of understanding the form of the generation of surplus value um, in this way, right? Like, like not just uh, being linked to labor, but being able to substitute like, right, what is labor? It's just another ingredient. I mean, it's the key ingredient, right? Marx would say, and I mean, orthodox Marxists will probably fight me on this or something, right? But I mean, there's multiple ingredients. Labor is one. Uh, right. But then there's also these other things that go into it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. what is usually called externalities. So, right. Yeah. So it's how it's that that's, what's been useful for me. Like the, the form of exploitation, um, as capable of being applied to different scenarios where the content is filled in, in different ways, whether it's labor, um, river water, uh, you know, whatever, hydrological cycles, nitrogen cycles, whatever it may be, so. Right, yeah, and people need to understand that the same thing that happens to the, to the natural resources in that process also happens to labor. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, like when Wendell Berry points this out with the, with the um, commentary on, you know, first, first we roll through America and the Native American way of life, you know, gets destroyed. And then industry rolls through and destroys the, you know, agrarian way of life. And, right. and now, you know, we reached the point in the 20th and now the 21st century where the, there, you know, it's capitalism is truly like, I think Marx used this term a revolutionary force. And it's constantly trying to find ways to reduce the amount that it has to pay um, labor, and for other things, it's trying to make make itself more and more efficient. <laughs> and so it's it doesn't have any regard for your way of life. You know, it'll it'll pull you from this way to that way. It'll make you retool like twenty times. It'll make you move. You know, to multiple points and um, in the country or on the globe. Um, and it doesn't care at the end of the day if you um, if you can't retool that's your problem, you know, and, and so I think, you know, not, not that, not that I would, I, I, I fully understand the, um, the problems involved with going in the opposite direction, but I think it's important for people to really fully um, contemplate just how destructive to community and culture capitalism has been. And yeah, right. Um, labor is like you said, it's just another resource, right? To, to be bought and sold and, and for the lowest possible price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is like, right. What best captures what you just said, you know, is the statement from the communist manifesto. Yeah. You know, everything that is solid melts into air, right? Like whether mm -hmm. this is, you know, I mean, to me, it's, somewhat hilarious in like a dark way to think about this in terms of like you know like dinosaur remains that have become oil you know which are now like burned and become carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 
right? But I mean, but you can also apply this, right? Like you said, you know, the dissolving of community. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, something that was solid, uh, literally slipping away and becoming kind of, right, this atomized, you know, shapeless thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, arguably, it's it's largely responsible for the, you know, for the secularization as well as the breakup of community. It certainly accelerated those things. I mean, in 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 my view, anyway. Um, and so, you know, something that is perceived of as this, it's associated in the American conservative ideology with family and faith is right. actually something that's ultimately extremely destructive of both. And, you know, now, now when Mark said that, he wasn't necessarily, he certainly wasn't arguing what I'm arguing, right? Um, he was basically saying, you know, like in previous eras, we had this sort of veiled illusion you know um that that kept people from seeing their exploitation and therefore they could live more meaningful lives right um and capitalism tears those illusions and those veils away which is true Mm -hmm. but of course he then wants to move forward into an even more rational you know economic and and social system right which i mean maybe if if people could actually do that i might be on board i'm really dubious right, about yeah. <laughs> really yeah, really exactly. dubious about that um but but i take away i mean part of what i've taken away from thinking more about capitalism through marx is precisely just how extremely um destructive it is right it seems to me like unless people can uh really embrace that thought they can't rein it in. They can't. This is a technique that's out of control. It's it's um. It's something that could be harnessed and could be made much less destructive than it is. Right. Maybe. Right. I don't know. I mean, how do you feel? Is this is that a system worth keeping, or do you think in terms of moving into something completely different at some point? I mean, yeah, I'm definitely hoping to move like on the side of yeah, we should find something else. But, right, like, this is where I think the work is cut out for us, um, is like, okay, we should find something else. Uh, what is that something, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean. It can't be, it can't be the old categories. Right. Yeah. And I mean, this, this, like, the, you know, the rise of the alt-right, the rise of Trump, you know, all of this um, is kind of reactions to, like, kind of, you know, people being discontented with neoliberal globalization, mm-hmm. right? So, so what, we are, what we now have is like neoliberal nationalization or something, mm-hmm. um, right? So, and I mean, like, like Lao Mouf make this point in their book, um, Hegemony and Social Strategy, right? Like that, you know, like, yeah, you know, we need to form these hegemonies, but, um, you know, they, they also recognize that like these hegemonies have also been formed on the right, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, Thatcher and Reagan appeared uh, appealed to, um, I mean, quite frankly, like wage laborers. So, sure, absolutely. So, That's why Reagan was elected. Right. Peeled yeah. an awful lot of Democrats off the Democratic Party, and they never have gone back. And this is right. So it's like, how do we formulate, you know, something? How, how can we form something around which a similar type of, you know, alliances and coalitions can be made? Um, mm-hmm. Right, right. And I know, like, well, we went back and forth just a little bit on the Facebook group um, about this right. very issue. Like, I'm... Yeah. This- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm dubious as to whether move what I, I mean, I'm... The jury's still out, you know. I don't fully understand Moof's argument, but I'm trying. Um, but I, I, I don't think I'm on board entirely with her solution or her attempt at creating some sort of, uh, you know, coalition or which which would be able to answer this huge like right juggernaut. Of course, right. she wrote the book in what was it, 1993 or something like that. Yeah. 
Uh, so it's kind of unfair because she she wouldn't have seen what we're looking at now with this new this new right. Um, but but I, I find I find her um, I don't know her argument that that we need to kind of find shifting temporary alliances amongst various groups of people without clear I fixed identities I. It, it feels too complex for to be to be promoted um, to people as a political movement, if that makes sense. I mean, I'm talking about intersectionality and and you know this this appeal to various groups mm -hmm. uh, to kind of find common cause in their various subordinations. Yeah. Um, well, and like you said, so you already know that I'm more sympathetic, I guess, um, right. towards Black Lion Move. And I mean, right, like when they were writing this, it was before Crenshaw coined intersectionality. Um, he uses the term in this book. Right, but uh, it's, I mean, in the, the hegemony and socialist strategy. Ah, gotcha. Um, is, yeah, is before Crenshaw's, but, but, but I mean, but like intersectionality is, is the gist of it. Um, and I mean, I would almost say that intersectionality, like originally as, you know, it came to be known in like black feminist thought is almost, um, it has the, like, like, right, like it's usually not formulated as at a general level as Laclau and Move formulated their dynamic and contingent subjects that arise, um, you know, out of these, you know, antagonisms um, with the system. Right, so so I guess I'm I'm probably just as skeptical as you to a certain extent, um, but the reason I'm sympathetic is because it's the best thing that I've seen so far, um, kind of for like you know uniting a disunited and like heterogeneous you know population. Right. Um, and part of that also stems from the fact that, like, the right is already doing this. Um, you know, like, like we said, you know, the auto workers and, you know, wage laborers or whoever, right, that, like, you know, Reagan and Thatcher won, it's because um, of their intersectional identities or I, I, don't, I don't like the term identities, um, actually, because it, like, refers to identity politics, which is... I don't know, maybe we'll do, but it, like, I don't view intersectionality actually as identity politics. Right. Uh, I, I agree. And like at the theoretical level, there are two different things. I just kind of feel that when it comes to practicalities, they become more, more the same thing, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And, and I think, and part of this is the de-radicalization of intersectionality. Mm. Right. So, but, but I mean, like, at, at base, um, you know, it, it's showing that oppressions um, are unique and contingent. Um, so, right, like the reason, you know, wage laborers were won by Reagan is not because, yeah, they're the proletariat, but also um, what he kind of played on was that what do all these groups have in common with, you know, the capitalists and other people that he went over? Um, and it's that, like, they thought that um, they, they were discontented by, you know, new, like, I don't know, the, 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 the nanny state or something, right? And I think like in today's world, you know, one way of kind of unite, and I mean, this is great actually, I mean, cause we're in like this really rough times in the US um, with Black Lives Matter. Uh, I mean, they're not the cause of this, right? But I'm saying like, Right, this movement has emerged in force, right? And um, it's, sh and all these other like liberationist movements are kind of joining the ranks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a great example of how Laclau and Moves, um, like conception of hegemony um, and like these coalitions arise, right? Because it's like, okay, um, you know, maybe like, like we're 
we are kind of empathetic and we're discontented by, you know, whatever it may be, right? So this is why um, an environmental group, right, or a queer trans group um, can kind of join the ranks of Black Lives Matter um, and argue for, right, like the defunding of the police, right? Because, um, you know, if you're, right, like an environmentalist who's protesting, uh, right, you're probably also exposed to some sort of violence, right? You know, there's been all this talk about, um, is it Stonewall, right? Mm -hmm. And and how, you know, this was a riot, uh, right? And it shows that, yeah, like queer people are also subjected to like unequal um, amounts of violence from the police force, et cetera, right? So there's this kind of, like like Lauren Mouffe would say, a discursive overlap, right, between queer movements and like Black Lives Matter, right? Which allows for this alliance to take shape. But in terms of a larger, like if we're wanting to confront, you know, like late capitalism or neoliberalism or, you know, whatever you want to call this, um, you know, and some would differentiate slightly between those two things is like, right, the discursive overlap would be those people who are discontented by a patriarchal, um, white supremacist, um, you know, neoliberal system, right? <laughs> um, so, so kind of the discontent would be the, like, quilting point around which all of these different threads can combine. Right. Um, yeah. and, and that's that's kind of why I think intersectionality is useful, right? Because if you're only folk like if you're, you know, if you're a part of a feminist struggle and you're only focusing on like um, you know, woman with a capital W, right? Or you know, what do you want to call like um uh gender differences or inequalities? Um, right, you're going to be you're going to be like wearing blinders to these other struggles, um, mm -hmm. as well. And, and it's it's going to have, you know, for example, um, you know, if there's a feminist discourse, uh, yet it fails to recognize racial disparities, that discourse is going to reproduce those racial disparities, even as it, you know argues for, um, you know, more gender equality. Mm -hmm. So, right, so, like, what intersectionality and what Laclau and Mouffe are kind of pushing for, um, and this is, like, right, like, my reason, I guess, for, like, kind of try, trying to hold on to them, which is actually difficult, right, because they're so discursive and, and I'm more materialist, right, but is what it means is it's not pushing the buck off onto somebody else. So, so that's like, because when you recognize intersectional identities and like your discursive overlap is this discontent, right? You don't want to shift your discontent onto somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's about like metamorphizing the system, uh, you know, metamorphizing capitalism, you know, towards you know, what they call like radical democracy, you know, where there's, you know, equality and liberty for all kind of thing um, right. which seems you know it is utopian but I think like rightly so yeah I mean this is part of where my doubt comes in I just wonder I you know I see pe how people behave even at, at the level of you know a small group mm -hmm. they can't seem to handle like radical democracy they can't <laughs> Somebody always like rules and and or resentments fester. So this is, you know, one one part of my hesitation to to embrace the point of view. Um, and then you know the other is and this is kind of like the the like shadow of Zizek, <laughs> like standing in the background uh, yeah. for me is I. I've been fairly persuaded by Zizek's argument that um, a lot of the, um, whatever we want to call them, sections that we are, you know, a lot of the, the various positions that we take and um, shifting identities that we have um, are, in his view, epiphenomenal. You know, in other words, they're like, 
the part of the reason why we have you know the feeling of subordination and we pin it on whatever the other group is that's doing that to us is because we don't want to see that ultimately that economic system that Marx um, was trying to describe is the the real reason why you know the the, the problems haven't been solved and we don't have more equality. Um, so in a way, I think you know Zizek's argument is a lot of times by by. By let's say by defining victory as ending subordination from white males, for instance, that we're missing the ultimate point. You know, we're mm -hmm. we're we're pointing in the wrong direction. Not that there is an exploitation by white males or whatever, but but okay. the white males as white males are not really the problem mm -hmm. from Zizek's perspective. Right. Yeah, so he would probably say like there is a hierarchy of oppression, right? Like there is this like yes. you know um, racial and uh, you know patriarchal um, mm -hmm. patriarchal um, oppressions, right? But these are subsidiary to like the larger economic, um, right? And to a certain and, extent, yeah, yeah, caused by it, right? And that they, right. they function as as almost like a way of continually neutralizing opposition to capitalism mm -hmm. so you know when people go out and march i mean again you know i get sort of a my stomach turns because i've seen a lot of protests and marches about a lot of things and and it looks like something is going to change and then lots of times very little changes ultimately right but everybody's kind of gotten it out there you know what i'm saying and so Right. You know, Zizek makes the argument that this kind of is, is a way of expelling the energy that maybe ought to be aimed directly at, at solving the fundamental problem, but it's not. I don't know. I'll, I'll shut up and let you talk now. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, yeah, you you can keep going if you want. I mean, um, yeah, so this, I think, I, I mean, I think I'll just like have to, to probably like agree to disagree type of thing, um, right? We, we will form, you know, we're forming a, a discursive overlap. Um, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, but right, like, so, so Zizek would say, right, there's this hierarchies of oppression. It like, has it, is it like Aud Audre Lorde or someone, I think in her book, Sister Outsider, or is it Bell Hooks? I don't know. Uh, like, like there's a black feminist writer, I can't remember who, um, which is terrible. Uh, because I like use this recently, actually. <laughs> uh, but 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 literally has an essay titled like "There Are No Hierarchies of Oppression," mm. um, and I think I don't. I'm trying to like part of this might also depend on like ontology, um, right? Like, and because I. Like, it seems like Zizek's kind of embracing, like, capitalism as, like, a type of totality or something, mm -hmm. um, right, which which I would not be comfortable doing. Um, right, like, like, I guess I, I would say that, um, right, like, if, if, if capitalism is a, is, it's not the totality, right, but it's maybe, like, you know, if we just like describe a totality as you know something at a more generalized level, which is you know anti what 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 Zizek would say like, yeah okay so capitalism is one totality amongst like infinite right, um, but yeah I'm I'm not that comfortable saying that, like capitalism is the only thing, um, especially yeah. not not like kind of like deflating capitalism to being something that happens only in the economic sphere, right? Because mm -hmm. in the similar way in which I view capitalism, not as this separate sphere from nature, right? Acting on nature, right? But it's, it's like, it actually is acting in nature, right? It's ordering, you know, um, it's ordering the planetary system and it's, it's re reorganizing it. Um, Etc. 
uh, right? It's also not separate from the spheres of, right, like racial and gendered struggle, mm -hmm. um, right? But it's capitalism is a way of, uh, like, like, it's a way of ordering and interacting with and organizing, right, the way in which bodies are treated um, in space, just as, right, like the way in which, like, like it's, 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 it's dialectical, I guess is what I'm getting at, right? Like the mm -hmm. same way in which capitalism orders nature, yet nature also, right, to a certain extent orders capitalism, right, you know, yeah. No, no matter what we do, right, we can't overcome, like, the, f the laws of thermodynamics. Um, similarly, <laughs> well, yeah, not, not yet. Similarly, um, like, the patriarchy and or, like, racism uh, kind of have, like, a reciprocal relationship with capitalism, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, and, the, and that yeah. you made a good point, and I also want, I'm, yeah, I don't want to say, like, I'm in full agreement with Zizek, because I'm not, because his solution yeah. is some form of communism, and I'm already pretty convinced that's not, you know, and the kind of communism that Zizek envisions is not one that I personally would enjoy. Right, probably. yeah. Um, but, but I, but I am somewhat persuaded that, that some of the some of some of the problems that we tend to associate with with racial, ethnic, religious, various different divisions or you know um, conflicts are those conflicts and divisions are produced by something more fundamental. That part I am fairly convinced. And it sounds like you at least somewhat agree with that too. That yeah, definitely we, yeah. Like the, the alt right sort of emerging as as a gut level response to neoliberal globalization, for instance, um, I I agree with that. You know, I I think that there's a lot of stated reasons why the new right has right has emerged, but but I think that at at a real fundamental level, this is this is a big part of it. Um, so so I I just. I just feel like in the process of trying to make sure we, let's say that the women get respect from men mm -hmm. and that ethnic minorities get respect from, from white people, that is of course correct. People should all respect each other. Right, yeah. This becomes our main theme. Maybe we are missing at least part of the, part of the problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, and, that's like so intersectionality wouldn't argue for that right like the same way in which kind of i so one way of framing this is like it's against fetishization right like so the w same way in which you can't like fetishize this around you know like the treatment of women by man or you know the treatment of african americans by cops or you know or something like this um you also can't fetishize it around the treatment of worker by capitalist right mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of like, um, I guess it's trying to embrace all of these things at once mm -hmm. um, in a way that also doesn't lose the particularities of these struggles. Yeah, which is good. And, yeah, but so, so that, I think that's, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm definitely with you on the point that, I mean, like if we just like our feminists or critical race scholars and we're not Marxists, you know, or post-Marxists, whatever, uh, <laughs> or anti-capitalists, let's say, um, since not everybody's on board with Marx kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like if we're just one of these things, we're going to fail, um, right? If our goal is like um, liberation and equality, uh, you know, or, or something like, like, like we will kind of, uh, come up short and or shift the buck right mm -hmm. um so so kind of trying to like hang all of these things together on like one nail that is at once multiple nails um for somewhat of a visualization uh is the goal i guess um okay. but yeah i mean i i de i i i and because we've had this yeah i mean i should also probably just like stop at stop talking at this point but 
<laughs> I, I mean, I, I will say that. Um, that never stopped you before. I know, I, it, but I, I agree with you, right, that like this is much more difficult to formulate than saying like we are workers and we are exploited. You know, it's saying I am a feminist and I'm exploited as a woman, so I need to, you know, or I'm, you know, I'm a feminist and I'm against the exploitation of women, you know, if it's me talking kind of thing, right? Um, it's much more difficult to, from that position, say, so I'm going to be against these capitalists, right? Mm. Um, so, so, I mean, on a practical level, yeah, it is more difficult. Um, but I think part of this is, a, is like, part of the work of this is that to form these type of alliances and coalitions is for people to come to the, re is, I mean, the formation of subjects, right? So like to have intersectional alliances, you have to have like intersectional subjects. And I mean, we could even like go as far as saying intersectional consciousness, mm -hmm. right? If we like, you know, drag Lukacs out of the dust and, you know, maybe, you know, <laughs> insert him into, uh, you know, something that isn't terribly Marxist. So, mm. yeah, that's, that's wow. the end of the, of this long jumbled ramble thing. Uh, that I just yeah. built, so. Well, I think you've given me, you know, like, well, we've both given each other some food for thought, but we're not in full agreement, and that's probably good. But um, we're kind of winding down here, but I'll yes. just, so, so feel free to be, you know, brief or whatever. But what, so like, what would your, if you could have um, whatever society you wanted, you could just, you could be like one of our friends imagines himself sometimes to be ruler of the universe. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what kind of society, what would it look like? Yeah, so when, as soon as you started, I was worried that this is where this question was going. Um, <laughs> of course. I, I mean, I'm not totally sure, um, but I don't think that's a bad thing. And right, like here, I'm going to play my like deconstructionist, postmodernist type card, um, which you know you can attempt to stomach and then like push back on me for. Right, if I knew, um, I will have already failed um, mm. to a certain extent, right? Uh, and this kind of goes against, right, like we were talking about technique and, right, like liberalism as, you know, descended from, and I'm purposefully saying descended from as opposed to saying ascended from, uh, the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, as in, you know, it got worse, yeah, but, but, right, like this fact that you can rationally plan something out and say that this is how it's going to be ahead of time, I mean, it's a good point. Yeah, I think this is not great. Like, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're going to run into problems. So there's this bit of Derrida, which I actually really like. And I mean, I think I understand. <laughs> so, but, but he talks about justice. And he says that justice cannot be deconstructed. But rather, justice is that which, like that by which, or for which, which probably is also like skewing him a little bit, um, we deconstruct, right? So he makes a difference between justice and the law, mm. right? Justice is what led protesters to enter the streets, right? And ask for a rewriting of the law, um, you know, in terms of defunding the police or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of embrace a similar stance of right like like if we think about like like justice um as this kind of force that like leads to the deconstruction of things like we need to deconstruct society um right because like like for justice but what is justice you know he says it can't be named kind of thing um but then on the other hand, right, and I actually threw this quote down because I read it recently and I was like, okay, this might be handy and I'm going to want to get it right. 
So Zizek, in his introduction to Frederick Jameson's essay, An American Utopia, uh, says that to change society, one should begin by changing one dreams, one's dreams about an emancipated society. Um, and I think this is super useful, right? Because um, utopia has some value and right this I understand this is in like direct contrast to what I just said about deconstruction and like justice right but at the same time like if you can't imagine something better right like how 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 are you ever going to have the energy to aspire for change right you got to have something to aspire to but you've but the problem that you've related to um, before is that people tend to tend to go from that dream to blueprint, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's the mistake. This is, so it's kind of like, I guess, the utopianism that I would embrace is not, not so much a blueprint, but it's more like impressionistic. And I think this is actually reconcilable with kind of the deconstructive view I like elaborated earlier of, right? If you view it as like kind of open, like, right, an open hole that is instead of like, this is like kind of totally inverting Deleuze and Foucault, um, which might not matter, but it's a, a weird thing to do, I guess, in my, in my head. But Foucault, Foucault talks about, right, like disciplinary societies where like, it's very rigid. So this would be kind of more like the blueprint Mm -hmm. right like like instead of doing things in this way we should do things in this way mm -hmm. whereas Deleuze talks about control societies where it's based on like access and networks and right like cutting off flows and stopping flows um and I think right like kind of instead of like viewing the con like the logic of the control society is the logic that we need to think with to formulate utopias right Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the reason we, we also have to do this is because like the logic of the control society is the logic of neoliberalism, right? Like neoliberalism is constantly running on enjoyment, right? And like radical ideas are always already, it seems, um, recuperated, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, the workbook we read is, you know, Verso Books, <laughs> you know, who's you know, you can go online, you can find it at, you know, 24 seven, you can Google it, you can find it, you can buy it for, you know, eight ninety nine or whatever. Um, so, right, like, if theory is constantly being recu recuperated, and like, radical ideas are constantly being recu recuperated, what do you do? Um, and I think what you have to do is you have to formulate something that is as open and as flexible as neoliberal capitalism. Um, mm. But but that is you know better whatever you that you know that is more more um, equitable um, and mm -hmm. is you know rooted in liberation or something right and and I think the deconstructive force of something like justice is like one of the best ways to do this right um, there's like a statement by I it's like it's either Adorno or Horkheimer or the two of them together. And I don't remember the text, right? But they say like, if we actually think that like Western society is this good thing, you know, that we're more just, more, you know, equitable, whatever, than we've been in the past. Um, and I mean, this is them saying, you know, they thought this, they were like totally drunk on the enlightenment. Um, mm -hmm. not, not, not I, hopefully. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, but if we think this, then we have to constantly critique it, right? And so this 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 plays also into right, like the Derrida point about like continually deconstructing the law in the name of justice. So it's like continually deconstructing um, existing society in the name of utopia, right? Yet utopia is always this unnameable thing. Uh, mm. So it, it's, it's right. It's like the, it's like the setting sun of the horizon. Um, right. You get a glimpse and it, and it draws you to it. Uh, but you can never see right. Like the other half actually kind of thing. 
Yeah. So it's nice. this is yeah. probably not a satisfactory answer. No, um, I mean, I tried to evade the question. But. It's pretty good, actually, because you, you've you acknowledged, which I think is very important for us all to acknowledge that when, like, an awful lot of the mistakes that people have made in the past that have ended up very badly, including the current one, mm -hmm. <laughs> the liberal um, economics and politics, is based upon the blueprint way of thinking. Right. And, uh, you know, to to have the humility to say that, you have aspirations, but you don't know exactly where that should lead um, is not only more like realistic, but also does invite more people to the table. You know, more, more visions can come into play if no one person or group claims to be some sort of, you know, messiah with all the answers. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's realistic. It's it's sort of like healthily unsatisfying. If that right. makes sense. Yeah. So I guess the last thing, like there's a visual that maybe like paints this better, um, is right, like a blueprint can always be entered into a code, right? And it can be absorbed into a code. Um, right. And if we're like we can think really literally in terms of like computer codes, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of what we need is a new code. Um, and then that code can go about absorbing these blue, blue you know, these blueprints um, in a different way, right? And it's a code that is, cannot be like, you know, it's a code where if it enters into, you know, the previously existing code, the neoliberal code, right? Um, it would kind of act as a virus, uh, corrupting it because of the conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, yeah, like what are the specifics of this code? I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. And code can be modified and changed and crowdsourced, I suppose is one way of. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 